In the review of last week, we were in Psalm chapter 7, and we did get through, or up to partially, in through verse 6, um, reviewing the very perspectives of understanding that David is under um, uh, circumstances from Cush, who we don't know exactly who Cush the Benjamite here in Psalm 7 is. Some Bible scholars uh, believe that it could be Saul the king himself. Uh, in this circumstance, the possibility is there, um, but we don't know exactly who Cush is, but we know that David is suffering persecution from the circumstances of what Cush is pursuing him for, and we know that it brings great uh, trial, and David is reaching out and pleading to God along on the basis of David's own righteousness in innocence, um, we looked at. And then we also look at the question of, or not the question, but we look at the perspective of David declaring the ownership as he prayed to God. My God in verse 1. And then we ask ourselves the question of, we declare my God in ownership, and then David also, in verse 1, says, In you I put my trust. We examine and ask ourselves the question of what does that word trust mean? And as quick and as easy as all of us say, well, of course I trust God. But what do we do? We go ahead and pray, ask God, take the anxiety away from me. And then we still worry about it. Does that fit to the meaning of the word trust? It doesn't. Because when you trust, you give and leave it in God's hands. And we, we talked about that. Um, we looked at David and his plea of innocence in his life and who he, he is laying his life before God, asking God to deliver him according to his innocence in Psalm 7, uh, 3 through 5, where he asks, is there any iniquity on my hands? Have I stirred the sleeping bear? Those are my words, my scripture's words. But has he repaid evil with evil in a time that this individual is at peace with him? So David's asking, did I, did I ask for this? God, is it something I've done that is bringing this persecution in my life? And then we continued on to verses uh, 6 and again 7. We ask, what is, does God have anger? And does he, do we have the same attributes as God does? And we looked at Genesis 1.27. And looked at ourselves in creation, that the Godhead, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, in their creation has let us create man in our image. So the emotions, we discussed some emotions about God. We discussed and, and named a few of anger, of course, compassion, grief, love, hate. The emotion of hate. Does God have the emotion of hate? Yes. Yes, he does. He hates sin. Okay. Uh, and then we looked at the emotion of jealousy, and then we looked at the emotion of joy and discussed those. We have all those emotions, but even though we were created in the image of God, are these emotions that we share with God the same in us that God has? And they may be the same emotion and title, but God's are perfect, and ours are seen into what? Sin. Sin. Okay, so um, we share a lot of those emotions being created in the image of God, but our emotions are tainted with 
sin. And we talked briefly about the portion of Scripture that God gives us by Scripture. God has given all of us permission to be what? You can be angry. Be angry all you want. Do, do not sin. Do not let the, and then we're told in that same area of Scripture, do not let the sun go down on your wrath or your anger. Uh, don't hold that grudge and carry it on into future days. Because that's exactly what that sun is. I know we were in review and we didn't talk about that. But what is that verse of scripture left the sun that would now on your ass? Or your anger? Why? Festers. Festers, absolutely. The more time you're angry, give Satan more time to work. Like a good mouth card. You know? <laughs> what goes down when when the sun sets, the evening sets, and you take the anger to bed with you and sleep on it. You don't sleep. Well, okay. you don't sleep, number one. You have a rough night, whatever else that. Is, but you don't give it up. What do you wake up with? You know? You know, we've all, we've all been married, right? Go to bed mad at your husband or mad at your wife. Keep it. Don't take care of it that evening. And wake up the next morning. Honey, you want some eggs? I don't want your nasty eggs. Well, okay, we did we let the sun go down on our lap. We don't carry it. It robs us of the joy that God wants us to experience. And so well, we talk about the emotions in perspective of God as David called out to God, asking him to rise up. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. What anger did David know that God had? What experience did David have at this point? In time with God's anger. Huh? No. Sodom and Gomorrah, he could refer back to Sodom and Gomorrah. And what, what arose in God in his anger in Sodom and Gomorrah? What did he do? He wiped them out. He can look back to the time that God was repented in his creation of man. No. What did he do? He wiped them out. Time and time again, he can look back to the Egyptians and God's anger rising up with the Egyptians not letting the children of Israel go. And God brought the plagues, and the plagues didn't convince Pharaoh. And so God went ahead with the Passover, the death angel, and finally I let him go. And then they pursued him, cornered him into the Red Sea, a lesson to the children of Israel, absolutely. But God parted and delivered the children of Israel through the Red Sea. And what did he do with the Egyptians? Wiped them out, right? Through the uh, Red Sea circumstances, they pursued the children of Israel. So David has examples in his life that he can turn back to and see the anger of God. So pursuing uh, from our review and moving forward tonight, on that anger, David is asking in Psalm chapter 7, verse 6, God rise up in that anger, because what does he expect from God's anger? But yet, judgment to his enemies are the ones that are persecuting. And what would that judgment, the way that David understands of God's anger rise up, what does that mean? It's going to, it's going to, maybe not wipe out the people, but it's going to wipe out and stop the persecution. Right? It's, it, it's going to wipe that out as David is asking God to rise that up and then continues, lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. In verse uh, 6, and continue to verse 7, rise up for me to the judgment you have commanded. So the congregation of the people shall surround you. For their sake they should therefore return on high. And, and you examine that, and David is asking God to rise his anger up. For the benefit of those who are righteous. And it will benefit them. For their sake, therefore, their, for their sake, therefore, return on high. The welfare is of God's people when God acts. Does God always act for the welfare of his people?
Who had Simon? Peter Lynch. Oh, that's not a true question. Does God always act? Well, fair of his people. Absolutely, yes. 100%. And maybe not. Oi, but the, would he only act for David without the benefit to his people? And, and what I mean by that in this case, David is asking God, rise up, bring your anger against those who are persecuting, so it stops, and I don't have to go through persecution anymore. And does God do that and not include anyone else in his actions? God includes everybody as he rises up. That's what David's referring to. For their sakes, therefore, return on high. The benefit of God's people, God acts. In that benefit, David would be a beneficiary of God's act, okay? But all other children of God would be a beneficiary also. Why? If they knew what David prayed, did God act? And when David asks, they see the faithfulness of God when God acts. Okay? So the beneficiary of God's acts will always be for all of God's children. God may act on your behalf. How does that benefit me? God acting on your behalf. God granting you safety as you travel. Okay? How does that benefit me? I pray, as all of you have traveled, that God give them safe travels. To show that God's has perfect. Does it not prove God's faithfulness to his children when they ask? And it was you. It got, God delivered you. He didn't deliver me. And it's the perspective when we ask God things and God acts, it's benefit to all of his children. That, hey, I prayed for you guys for safe travels. God answered that. He gave you safe travels. I don't want to go through the sorrow aspect of you not having safe travels. But he delivered you. But it proves that God is faithful. And what does it do to my heart? It encourages me. Because if God is faithful to you as a child of his, I know he's going to be faithful to me as a child of his. So it always benefits all when God acts. Now, like I said, I don't want to mislead and say it's a direct, but just as I shared you in that example, you were the direct benefit. God granted you safety, but it's encouraging to me to watch God act because it proves God's faithfulness. So looking down to Psalm uh, 7, in verses 8 through 10. I um, have some interesting perspectives here and a few questions um, in regards to what occurs here. Let, let's read um, 8 through 10 in regards to what we see here. It says, the Lord, the Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, and according to my integrity within me, oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. My defense is of God, who saves the upright in heart. What is, what is David asking for here that so many times we don't ask for? Okay, judgment exactly to who? To him. Who, I mean, he, he, he knows, he believes, and he knows God knows he believes. Okay. And, and he's not worried about. Okay. So the challenge comes down to the word judge here that David is using is vindicate. Uh, the Lord shall vindicate the peoples. Vindicate me, O Lord. What David is saying here is, I cannot ask 
ask God to judge them and me expect to not be judged. Did I say that right? Yes. Okay. I cannot ask God that God see. Look, look. I cannot ask God to point fingers. If I'm not willing to allow God to go, Dan, look. Here's the mirror, Dan. You're asking for me to stop the perseverance or the, um, the, uh, not perseverance, but the, uh, trial or persecutions that you're going through, but let me hold the mirror up and what are you doing over here but yet causing trials and struggles in someone else's life because you're not willing to forgive. But you're asking me to have them forgive you and you're praying for forgiveness that they would forgive what you've done and the persecution would stop if there was such a cause, but you're not willing to forgive over here. How dare we ask God to do something on our behalf when we're not willing to allow him to go, hey, Dan, you're asking, but you're not willing. But that's not what he's saying here. What's that? He's saying, judge me like he judges other people. Judge me? Yeah, so I cannot ask God to judge them if I'm not willing to be judged myself. Yeah. Okay, so how can I ask God to take away that persecution when I'm creating circumstances of persecution over here? Okay, we have to be willing to let God judge us in the same perspective we're asking David here in judging others. The exact words that I wrote were probably much better. These are my words. Cannot accept judgment to others unless we are willing to accept judgment ourselves. Okay, cannot, that does not accept, it's expect. Cannot expect judgment of others unless we are willing to accept judgment and that's what David is writing here of, judge me, God. Look at me and my righteousness. Look at my integrity. And I'm willing to be judged as I'm asking you to judge others. That's a tough one. Think about it for a moment. Do you ask that of God? God. I'm willing to be judged as I ask you to judge others. Because when we ask God to intervene in circumstances and challenges and deliverance in circumstances in our lives, maybe with other people, every circumstance we deal with has to do with someone. Maybe a step out of it, but it has to do with someone. And we ask God to go, deliver me. We have to be willing to be judged ourselves. And that's what David is saying. And David is asking for God's what on the people that are persecuting him. He goes up and he asks, verse 9, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end or stop. And God establish the just. So, as David's praying, he's asking God for God's vengeance and not his own. What does that bring to mind? I, I gave you the key word that David is obedient even to New Testament scripture that he didn't have in his hands. That word vengeance. What does God say about vengeance or the word that is vengeance from vengeance is revenge? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Who has the right to bring vengeance on anyone? Who has the right to bring revenge? You or I? 
even if someone caused strife in my life. Okay? We can relate to this because it happened here. Do I have the right to bring revenge against anybody because of the Oxford situation? No matter who it is, name whoever you want, do I have any right to bring vengeance against that? Think about it. As angry as we are, still soft, still tender, still you hear it in Nashville, and what does it bring back? Pain. I mean, the minute I heard it, I'm like, again, what did it bring back? It brought back our day of November and what we went through. But do I, in that horrible circumstance, it's soft. But let's relate to it. Do I have any right for vengeance? Vengeance is my say of the Lord, but the Bible also tells me I. Who has that authority? Do it's I? God, no, it's God's authority, and He will avenge you. If I allow Him yeah. to, does God avenge if I step in and decide to take my vengeance? He may still avenge for because God is what? This is where we're going to get ourselves in trouble, not in trouble tonight, but this is where my, my toes get stepped on. We are, as a society, we are as believers and Christians in, in the year 2000 that we sit in, we are quick to point out the attributes of God that benefit us as a person. God is love. God is merciful. God is grace. God is all known. God is all that. And then hold on. God is just. And he's not just going to be just towards the vengeance of Oxford. Roy Book and God will deal with that. God's going to be just in my life also. God is going to Allow that, and who has that right is God. I want to point us to Romans chapter 12 in that application of the things that we're looking at. Go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 14. We're going to hang right there at Romans chapter 12 for a moment. Romans chapter 12 in verse 14 and, and I want us to remember what David was just asking for okay, and what we see in Psalm 7. Romans chapter 12 in verse 14 says this Bless those who persecute you. Bless and what? Do not curse. You ever, you ever grab hold of that? Think through that for a moment? Those who persecute me, bless them. That means in that word bless, I am to do good for them. I am to provide for them if I know they have a need that I can meet. And yet they're the, they're the source of my struggle. They're the source of my persecution, and I am to bless them. Think about that. That is not easy. But that's what David's asking for. Remember what we just read. He's asking for vengeance according to what? His righteousness and integrity. And that's exactly what Paul is writing here. Because we jump to verse 17, and you can look at it all, and we'll continue quickly because those verses have application. But 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Here's 17. Repay no one evil. What? Evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. So even though you've done evil, how am I to repay you? 
The answer is, I'm not. I'm not to worry about repaying you. God is, God is going to hit. We'll see vengeance in mind, saith the Lord. God will repay, not me. So I'm not to repay evil with evil, but I'm to be focused on the good things in the sight of all men. Verse 18 says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, there it is, here's the key one, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So what are we to do? What are we to do in the, in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? What does Jesus tell us to do when our enemy takes uh, slaps us on his cheek? What are we to do? And Pastor Dan's words turn and give another chance to take a slap on the other side. That's really what that scripture says. And he may slap the other. What is God saying? You take Christ's words that were to turn the other cheek, were to forgive how many times? Seven times 70, right? So 491 times, not, not, not way, but not happening. That's not the application of the math there, but it really is 490, but it's not just Christ that we always forgive. And our response is not one, to be vengeful. And it has, as time has gone on, you see all the people changing in our circumstances that we've experienced. Look at the people now supporting the lawsuits. Look at the people that want and preach. I'm not saying we shouldn't have accountability. Accountability to the point of hang. Hang. Because if X would have done the what, that would have never happened. I'm not saying we shouldn't have accountability, but what are we after when we say hang? Why do you want to hang? No. Because that will repay, will it? Will it change the outcome of what happened? Can we investigate? And look at circumstances and say, shouldn't have done that, that, or that. We're changing so that doesn't happen again because of those circumstances. That's accountability. Hang on. Vengeance. Who has the right to do that? God does. But does someone else, does God give someone else the right? The judges. The government. The government of the Lord. You don't. But the government does. And God allows judges. Um, I think we're going to look at that. Hebrews 10 and verse 3. Uh, yeah, uh, Hebrews 10. Oh, yeah, where am I at? Verse 3 says. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. That doesn't, I jump that. That's my next. No, not jump. That doesn't have to do with the judge. But God gives government the authority in this vengeance because what do we do in the perspective of the judges that rule with compassion? Is compassion always just? This is another thing that people need to understand in society of God and him being just. And what David is writing here in Psalm 7. We want God to be compassionate towards us, right? Please, God, show me compassion in this circumstance. I don't want your justice. But we want our judges to do what? If we're on the side of the circumstance in before a judge, we don't want to judge here on earth the rule of compassion, do we? 
Do we want to judge on earth for rule of compassion? Is it for a hot seat? For a hot seat, we do. Well, of course, I can hot seat on mine for yeah. But in the perspective of what we're talking about, man's heart, and what really applies here is the nasty sin involved in, in, in murder really goes and applies, depending on what side of the coin you're on, and you're exactly right, Bill. But if it's a relation of mine that was murdered, do I want the judge to rule in compassion? I want him to rule how? I want him to be just. Rule just like you're supposed to. That's your job. That's the God-given job that he gave to you is for you to rule just. So why do we expect God to rule differently? And see, society, that's where society gets God's God. Love, mercy, grace, compassion. He is. But he's also what? Don't ask God for him to bring vengeance on someone that may be persecuting you unless you're willing to say, God, I know you're just and you're just in my life too. You bring that vengeance, but also show me. And that's what David's saying. So it's, it becomes very, very difficult as we look in this psalm and begin to see David's heart that he's willing He's willing, back to Psalm 7, from where we're at there in Romans, he's willing to ask God of these very things. And when God is on our side, God sees and agrees with our cry. What do we have to worry about? Whoever God is against is absolutely defenseless. Do you believe that? Who God is against is absolutely defenseless. They can't stand. No matter who they are, Satan's going to learn that. That he is going to be able to stand. And he already knows that, that that's the fact as we've participated. So we see David's trust that he has in asking God here in 7, 8 through 10. My defense is of God who saves who? That word upright can be the righteous in heart. Those that are right with God, God will save in this perspective of what David's talking about. God is the one backing up just a little bit that I overlooked. We talked about God being just, but established the just. For the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. He knows the purpose why David is asking. He knows your purpose why you're asking. That brings up another question that I jotted down here. God, bring vengeance because you told me I can't. Come on, let's talk. Let's be serious. God, bring vengeance because you told me I can. But anyone actually bring something like that? I'm asking you. What's wrong with that word? Oh, people, maybe they would, but I guarantee you they would. Well, I'm asking us. Will we bring that? No, I would not. What's wrong? Is there something wrong with it? Is somebody that would pray that prayer? Of God bring vengeance on Dan because you told me I can't. Number one, we're not the judge. Right? But I'm asking the righteous judge to bring vengeance on him. I'm asking the righteous judge to bring vengeance on you because God, you told me I can't. That's being a little painful. Okay? You know, that is. Well, that's almost what David is doing. Almost? Almost, I will give you almost. It, there's an aspect in David and what he's saying that is different than what I say. God, bring vengeance on them because you told me I can't. He's asking for judgment on his side as well. And what 
is what, why am I asking God for vengeance? What am I asking God to do? Destroy your enemy. I'm asking God, 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 you told me vengeance is yours. Please provide it to that person. Because you told me I can't. There's the key. You told me I can't. So I'm asking you to do it. All right? What's my heart attitude? Well, why am I asking God to do it? Because I want revenge on them. But God, I'm going to be obedient to you. And I'm not going to get that revenge. I'm going to ask you to do it instead. It's a hard attitude that's different from David's request in what I just shared. And my hard attitude is I'm still seeking revenge. I'm just hiding behind God's word. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Don't repay evil with evil. Okay, God, fine. I'm going to obey that, but you go get revenge on that. You just hold this cold. It's, there you go. Exactly. In my statement that I'm using, but that's what society does. We take God's word and we hide behind it and go, okay, God, go ahead. You, you, you get revenge on them because you told me I can't. Am I blessing them? What am I asking to happen to them? In my heart, I want revenge, vengeance. And I'm just asking God to be the I'm not letting God be the just God. He sees it may not take that what I just shared with you out of your mind for a moment. There was a point of discussion. But when God goes, vengeance is mine. What's how is he delivering that vengeance? Is he delivering that vengeance at a request of mine for revenge? No. He's delivering that vengeance as what David declared the just. God will establish the just and expect God to do it from that perspective. But society likes to stand behind vengeance's mind and say, well, well, fine, God, get vengeance on them. They deserve it. Um, we just violated that whole portion of scripture in Romans chapter 12. We violated it from the start to the very end. Because our heart is a heart of revenge, not the hearts of blessed those who persecute. And then run a lot. I, they will, God is the just God. God will bring them. He says He will. I'm not about to ask. But remember, David started asking the judge, me first, God, by that same standard of what I'm asking for. That is different. It's a different heart than God bring vengeance and kill my enemies. You see the difference between those two? I hope, I, I hope I've done that justice between those two. Because David is asking God to have them stop and bring vengeance, and you be the just, you are the righteous one, you are the just judge. But don't forget, God, I'm asking the same for you. Judge me by my righteousness and integrity. That's the difference in what we have because the heart of it. Any questions in regards to that? So vengeance is not ours. It is God's. And God will always act justly. And when we're in discussions with individuals around us in perspectives that get tied up in the perspective of God being a just God, or God being a God of compassion, love, mercy, everything else. They want God to rule with compassion to them, but they want justice in every act in their life. It's my goodness. They exactly. <laughs> stick in iron and stone. Yeah. And is that, what is that? We're going to see what it is. Turn with me to Matthew 23. In that exact question, they just ask you, what is it? God, rule with me, deal with me in your compassion. And my enemy, God, use your justice on them, please. Jesus doesn't point out the words that I'm using in Matthew 23, but he points out the word and how he sees it. Yeah, 
find the 14th of my sister. Verse 14, I know. I'm supposed to, they're supposed to go weird. Verse 14, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Here's the word that I said Jesus is declaring. God, rule we be with your compassion and for your justice on them. Okay? Hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. So, who are we as we beg God to deal with us and maybe in our wrongdoings? In circumstances that we do wrong, oh God, share with me your love and your compassion and judge me through your compassion. But them, they deserve you to be a just God. What is that? What is Jesus declaring from the Pharisees and scribes here? What's he called? Hypocrites. Why won't you allow yourself to be judged by the same standard? Where the rubber meets the road. And David didn't do David said, Judge me, God, by my righteous integrity, as you are just and will have vengeance on them. Okay? So we cannot, and this is society, this is so much society, as we look at it today, I hear time and time again, and I was just I was just involved in a a uh, Talk, I wasn't in the talk show, I was listening uh, to a Christian's talk show, and a, uh, it wasn't, he wasn't an American pastor, he was a foreign pastor, and you may have seen it, there were little words on Facebook, and if you didn't see it, you clicked on it, I hope you listened to it, but it was a warning to pastors. It was a warning to pastors that will not teach the scriptures, but then want God's blessing when they're judged. They won't teach the accuracy of scripture. They will take advantage of the scripture and make you feel good, but not that you truly know who God is. I'll preach God's love. I'll preach God's mercy. I'll preach God's um, grace. What else should I preach? Yeah, I should preach God's justice. Because if I don't preach God's justice, then what happens with sin? God accepts it. Because he's love. And love does what? Mm -hmm. Right? He's merciful. Doesn't give me what I deserve. He's grace by giving me what I don't deserve. Stop that. Okay. And I'll just share with you, there's a TV evangelist that I stand so strongly against, and I'll say his name, and I'll go all see But he preach the justice of God. You do that, your followers are going to get their eyeballs this big around because all you do is stuff. God's love. No matter what you do, he covers it in love. Is that true? If that's true, what do we need Christ for? If we don't go to heaven without Christ. Exactly. We'd all be in heaven without Christ. We didn't need to have the sacrifice. We didn't need the cross because God just can cover it all in love. God is a just God as much as he is of love, mercy, and grace. And pastors today won't preach that God of justice because what is it? It's God's justice that condemns us to hell. Through his holiness, we are sinners and sin deserves to be judged. How is it judged? I want to judge fairly. I want to judge right. And who can do that? God. And he's going to do that. And he's given us an avenue for our sin to have already been Judged by him. And where was that? In two weeks, we'll see it at Easter. God judged my sin. God judged the whole world's sin on the cross. You need to accept that. That Jesus Christ is your Savior. He paid 
the sin, the penalty for sin for you. And if you won't accept that, you'll pay it yourself. We were talking about you last night. Um, Cousin Doug was over, and his church was um, a Methodist. And so they had voted to split and do something I don't know. Because they're going so far to the left. We told him, we said, not the end. We said, he preaches the Bible. He says it's wrong. Either they split split that church, of course. And that's what you do. Yeah, but they're quite um, get a bit uh, method. We told him he needed to go. Right. Well, it's, it's the perspective of how, how can I say this without I don't want to sound right. I don't want to God does not love me any more than he loves you. You're held to a higher standard. I am on the same platform. But when I stand at that altar and I preach this word, God's going to use the words that I say to judge me. He's not going to use those words to judge you. Unless I preach this. I preach this. Guess what? He's using the same words that I preach to judge you and any both. I preach anything different than this. Those will be the words that God are, God's going to judge me by and not you. And so that is true. The, the word is I am held to a higher standard, but not not a standard that God loves me more because I preach his word than you. Uh uh-uh. If I preach the truth of God's word, you and I are the same perspective when it comes to God's judgment. When I change God's word, God goes, I'm going to cast your hand off and do those words you preach like and see where we get that. Because it's not the truth of my word. And that was basically the, 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 the gist of the context of what I was listening to of this foreign pastor preaching and sharing to pastors preach God's word and don't change it because you will be judged by what that what you haven't preached of the truth of God because you change it you want everybody to think God is love and of course those pictures of all these pastors in the U.S. that preach the exact and they won't preach the justice and we must understand that God is a just God. Um, we are to ask this question. The justice of God is easy to understand if we simply compare it to what we expect from our earthly judge. I use that as an example. We don't think it is right or good if a human judge excuses crime in the name of compassion. Unless I'm the beneficiary of that. Then what's wrong? So, continuing on in what we see here, um, we're in verse what, 11. God is a just God, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Here's that word again that God is angry with the wicked every day. What does this mean? There's sin every day. Uh huh. So, He's angry every day. Okay, so is our God just sitting up there angry? No, he's not angry all the time. Okay. But this says he's angry um, with the wicked every day. Well, yeah, because there's, there's a lot of wicked people. Absolutely. What a, and, and you're right, and God is angry with the wicked every day. But what does that mean? That there's still sin in the world. There's still sin in the world, sure. And what will God be in his anger? He will be just. just. And he is going to judge it. We make the mistake. We make the mistake. Does God always, in Hebrews, I didn't write this down. This is a thought that just came in my mind. When we are not chastised as children of God, or sin in our lives, and God does not chastise us, if he never chastised us, Scripture in Hebrews tells us that we would be considered bastard children. Okay? Because God's chastisement proves he loves us, and that we're his children. Okay? But does God always chastise us in our wrong way? 
in our sin, does God always chastise his children? He judges sin. But it depends on... I, it depends let me on stop you for just one second. Just one second. Anymore. I, I want to I wanna correct this. He judges sin. You're 100% accurate. As a child of God, has your sin already been judged? Yes. So I want to stop you on that thought. And we're talking about children of God. I'm just helping you think. Take the judgment away. Your sin's already judged. Chastisements is God. Slapping him on the hands or hand. Listen, you're spanking your child for doing something wrong. That's chastisement, okay? And, and I, I just gave you a perfect example of that. Did you always spank your child for doing something wrong? Did you always do that? Okay? But did you always chastise your child for something they've done wrong? Ever been a time that your child did something wrong and you're just like, that is appropriate. And man, you just let this. Yeah, I've done this, man. I have. I've had a several times. My kids have said, never mind. I have. And what do we do? The, what is the problem with that? In our human mind, in society, and I say our problem, it's not my problem. Because I would hope I understand scripture and I don't take advantage of God's compassion. I hope I don't take advantage of God's grace and his mercy. And when, when I need to be chastised, I hope and I pray, God, that you will give me the heart of David and I will ask for that judgment according to the righteousness and integrity that I have. And I want you to be just to me. God being just to me today, as a child of his, doesn't have hell anywhere in it. It's wrong. My sin was judged on the cross. Your sin as a believer in Jesus Christ was judged on the cross. God does not always chastise our wrong. What happens is, when it's not, we go in and we take advantage of God's compassion. And what do we do then? I wouldn't want you to get away again. <laughs> the exact circumstance of what Paul writes, obviously this is David, and we're looking at Psalm 7, but Paul writes in Romans chapter 7 that we take advantage of God's compassion and his willingness going, you're still wrong. I'm still a just God. If his grace or his mercy does not change his justice, but God goes, I'm not going to chastise. It's a growing pain to you, just as we as parents do to our children. And then what do our kids do? Probably or do it again worse than what they did before. They take advantage of our compassion. And society takes advantage of God's compassion. And when they take advantage of his compassion, because God stands and goes, No, you don't have to worry about God. He's all about love. He's all about grace. He's all about mercy. It's taken advantage of. But God here, David says, God is angry with the Every day, God's justice will prevail. God's justice and sin will always prevail. Every day, because you think you got away with it today, God's justice can show up tomorrow or the next day. He will always be just. He will always, every day, just because it doesn't show up in God and his mercy love does not have to bring chastisement in his eyes of how he handles us as his children. Because what does verse 12 say? Keep that same thought. Let's, let's keep going here for a moment to finish this portion. What does verse 12 say? If he does not turn back, who? Who does not turn back? 
No, no, back out here. God's angry every day and is ready to bring chastisement to children of his or judgment to those who are not children of his. But it says what? In verse 12, read the whole verse. I kind of, I didn't do you justice there. I, I did you wrong. Sorry. Verse 12, read it. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. So, okay, let the, the last two sentences are God. The first sentence is who? You and me. Yeah. Wrong to me. If we're not going to turn away from it, what is God standing willing to do? He's angry with sin every day. What is he standing willing to do? What does he say? What does David say? Hey, you that are persecuting me, out of everything we've discussed so far, you that are persecuting me can stop the very thing that I'm praying to God of heaven, our creator, that I'm praying him to do. You can stop it by doing what? Turning away from what you're doing. But God stands ready to give or to um, exercise his justice on sin in all ways. Why does God hold back this perspective? It gives this opportunity as allowing one to turn out. Why? His forgiveness. And God is exercising what attributes when he allows that? Mercy. Sure, compassion. The two big ones are mercy and grace. Because when God holds back immediate application of the justice, is it because the sinner is not guilty? Okay. The law is not really clear. These are words in my study guide. These aren't my questions. These are words in my study. Is it clear? Mankind, in fact, really deserves God's mercy? What does society think? I mean, obviously, we're here studying God's word because we have a desire to want to know God more, to take application from his word and please him as our Heavenly Father. But what does society think? God doesn't. Punish your judgment. What gives God that right? Think about society today. Is that not their statement? What gives God the right to judge me? Who is he? Now I can tell you who he is. Okay? But society thinks they deserve God's mercy. What do they want? I want God's mercy. We're going to examine over the next two weeks um, on Easter Sunday, I think. I got two sermons going on right now that I'm studying for. They're, they're doing this to me right now. It is finished. You might hear that this Sunday. It's, it's a portion. It's not the whole sermon. But what do those words mean? And in declaration, who's entitled to those words were declared by Christ. It is finished. Who's entitled to those words? I'll tell you later when you hear the sermon. Oh, okay. what do you think? Huh? <laughs> Easter Sunday. Yeah, by the way, you might hear it this Sunday. I'm not <laughs> sure. I have, I'm not joking. I have the two messages <laughs> twisted and I don't know where I placed it. And I'm telling you the honest truth. But it is finished. Who's entitled to those words? It's it's silent, silent. They must they accept Jesus or not. It's finished. You're entitled? No, you're not. You deserve those words? There's only one. The only one that deserved those words was Jesus himself. I'm done.
freely and embrace and your mercy because God wanted to reconcile us to Him. We're not entitled to that. But society looks at it. I deserve God's mercy. What do you deserve? Roman or John 3 17 tells you exactly what you deserve. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world because man was already condemned. We don't go on in John 3 far enough. We stop and teach John 3.16 so our children memorize it and know it. And the most known scripture throughout the whole Bible. And we stop short of John 3.17. For some reason that's been a stick in my side over the last few months as I do my own personal devotion and I ask, can I go with you? I'm guilty. I caught a lot. I was commanded a lot. I was in a lot. I'm like, man, I'm focused. John 3 16 gives you the plan of salvation. It wraps it all up. And then you look at society today and go, there's only one verse for that. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. You were already condemned. We don't go one verse further. Amen. So, in this perspective of God in his justice, God, in people accuse God that he's not really just because I don't deserve hell for my sin. No, why are you not agreeing with that? You know, we need to be together. So, God is just, he stands ready, he will sharpen his sword, he bends his bow, and makes it ready if he does not come in. And then you look at the, you look at the, he also prepares himself instruments of what? Remember David writing this. What has he experienced? What does he know from God's anger? He'll wipe you out. Death. Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah. God didn't tolerate it. I'm done. David's writing this from that perspective of his knowledge. And he also prepares the instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shells. I find out. We'll be like, oh, we're really. So, wrapping it up, God is a God of mercy, He has a God of grace. He stands ready for the judgment and chastisement of sin if we are not willing to turn back. All right? So let's remember these things that David is asking God of, how he's asking them. As we started our study in Psalm, I warned you, not a bad way, that we are going to see the heart of David. We are going to understand why God said what he said in his Romans Acts that David is a man after God's own heart. We won't lie. And this is a perfect example. God judged me according to the same things that I